but for people who are joining in on either platform, welcome, good afternoon, good morning. This is the second session of the Man of Faith in the Age of AI, what Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik can teach us about society, each other, and ourselves with Rabbi Levi Morrow. This class today is, as today is the second class, we will be looking at the tension, examining the tension between the individual and society, which Rabbi Soloveitchik calls loneliness, examining what causes it, and how revelatory dialogue might relieve it. Uh, for those not familiar, Rabbi Levi Morrow received smicha from the she the Shehebar Bar Safardic Center in Yerushalayim and is a PhD candidate at the Hebrew University in Yerushalayim, where he is researching Rav Shigar's, no, Rav Soloveitchik's political theology. Um, sources will be posted in chat on both platforms momentarily. And if you are, if you have questions, I will be monitoring the chats on both Zoom and Facebook Live. We do want to hear what you have to say. And if you are on Zoom, I'm going to send invitations to join as panelists. That will let you unmute yourself, turn on your camera, show yourself, make a nice Beit Midrash environment if you're able to. Um, keep an eye out for that soon. I'll send them once uh, class gets underway. You know that? Rabbi Moro, the floor is yours. And thank you, Kayla. Um, thank you as well to Drisha for again for hosting this wonderful uh, teaching opportunity for me. Thank you. Um, just a quick review. Last week, for those of you who are here, we talked about um, I think are sort of the more basic AI questions, um, which are essentially not even AI questions, it's technology questions. Talk about thinking about AI as one form of human technological endeavor and the importance of asking about not what is AI so much as uh, what are people doing that we call AI. This week, we are going to dig down into the question of what does it mean to talk about artificial intelligence or artificial persons and what do we mean and what when we talk about AI in contemporary our contemporary moment in society the things that people are currently calling AI what is that where does that fall um, and so that's what we're going to do uh, today that will set us up for next time to sort of explore even further in this direction I'll talk about that a little bit at the end of class um, for now I want to start with a sort of introductory PowerPoint that will uh, help us get started Okay, so this class is titled, Do Androids Believe in Electric Gods, Artificial Intelligence versus Artificial Persons? Um, and the, the title is a play on this famous book by uh, award-winning author Philip K. Dick, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Um, and it's one of many, many sci-fi texts and video, you know, me general forms of media which deal with this question. Um, I put over here some on the, on the top of my head. We have Do Android Dream of Electric Sheep, the Blade Runner movies, which are in fact based off of this book. Um, iRobot is a more modern video, but there's lots of versions of this, of AI, uh, you know, media, of, of uh, movies and, and literature, asking this question of are robots people in some significant sense, right? Um, if anyone's a, a Doctor Who fan, I find that when I've seen episodes of Doctor Who, it's one of the things that comes up a lot is the question of what counts as a person. Um, and that's really the ultimate question of AI it has to be dealt with first. If you're going to ask, is AI a person? You have to be able to ask, um, what is a person? We'll come to that in a second. First, I want to mention that um, this is, is a, a question that has a long history in the um, philosophy of computing. Uh, so Alan Turing, one of the people sort of involved in the invention of early computers, uh, came up with what's called the Turing test uh, to be able to determine if a computer is if we, it's typically that if we have achieved uh, artificial intelligence, but the um, the idea of the Turing test is you can imagine you, that you're a person C behind a wall and you get uh, are able to inter interact with or receive readouts from people on the other side of the wall, one from a computer and from a person. And if you can't tell the difference, if you can't tell who's the person versus who's the ro the computer, then that means we have at least functionally achieved or artificial intelligence or the ability to, to communicate like a person is when we would have arrived at that level of uh, technology. And so the basic question, like that's a, uh, the basic idea of the Turing test is one that's very popular. You'll find in all kinds of um, articles about, um, about AI nowadays, either explicit reference to Turing test or 
just functionally, they're do asking this question. And I interact with AI and it feels like interacting with a person. It must be we've uh, arrived at what it means to be a person. And what that means is that there's some sort of basic sense of what a human being is that has to do with communication. And that means that what it means to be a person is to be able to communicate like a person. And so that for AI, if they can communicate like a person, then they might be like a person. And one of the places you find this sort of discussion um, is in moral philosophy. Right? This is a book I, I have not read, but it's called AI and the Trolley Problem, which is sort of a famous uh, moral quandary that involves asking questions about uh, moral responsibility, what you're supposed to do, and the moral worth of a person. How do you evaluate how you treat other people? And those are both questions that come up in contemporary discussions of AI. One is like, you know, if you have to decide between a person and an AI at some point in a, a life or death situation, should you treat artificial intelligence the same as a person? But also, and this comes up a lot when it comes to things like self-driving cars, do AI have moral responsibility the same way a person would? Do we expect the AI to make decisions? Can they make decisions? Um, what does it make any sense to talk about them making decisions? All of those have to do with basic questions of what it means to be a person. So that's going to be what we're going to dig down on today. Um, I want to look for one second at another facet of this discussion, uh, which is that our engagement with uh, AI ideas specifically, and also with tech more broadly, has really affected the way we think about what it means to be a person. Right? If you've ever seen someone talk about the human mind as if it was a computer, or you talk about sort of uh, futurist uh, discourse around maybe, you know, one day people to upload their minds to the cloud, upload human consciousness to the cloud, those all assume a certain understanding of what it means to be a person that is roughly you could be converted into data. That what it, a person is is something that it would make sense to talk of as data. And I'm not sure that's the most compelling way to talk about it. Well, we'll see as we go through. Actually, I, I think I'm very partial to Rob Soloveitchik, sort of over here, or his approach to um, this question of what does it mean to be a person? And it's going to involve very specifically uh, that which can't be just re rendered as or regarded as data. Um, so these are going to be the guiding questions for how we think about um, AI and people throughout this uh, class as we look at some text from Rafael Soloveitchik. I want to come back to these questions, right? What are the things we're calling AI? And I'll talk about that in a second, but how do they work? Um, or do people work that way? How are they made? And are people made that way, right? Can you imagine a person coming into being the same way a large language model comes into being? And can you uh, imagine them functioning the same way? Are there important differences? Uh, exactly that sort of thing, right? So um, a moment before we look at sources, um, the basic versions of technology of machine learning that's going on now, the say primary different forms of AI, whether it's art, or language generation, um, or uh, driving, you know, to algorithms and things like that, is that you can train on existing data. You take existing versions of wh um, whatever form of media is out there. So let's take art generation as an example. You just absorb and consume every single bit of art you can find and recombine bits of it and then spit out something new, right? And so the single bits of data all can be recombined in different ways. And if you combine enough data, you get something like novelty and some sort of new thing. And the question is, is that how people work? Do we work by just absorbing bits of information and mixing them together in different ways? Or is there some other sort of factor in who we are? Um, and a lot of this sort of conversation often will immediately go to the question, like, oh, what does it mean to be a person is to have a soul? Uh, in some ways, soul is a name for what we are. We'll see that our subject doesn't go in that di uh, direction. Uh, I want to jump to our source sheet. I'm going to tell you the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, faith. Um, the book that this is sort of the guiding structure of this course is, is the underlying framework of it is The Lonely Man of Faith. And for Rosalvechik, to be lonely as a, as a person is, is a, to have faith. And we'll see what that means. Exactly, because be faith is going to be to have a feature of yourself that can't be reduced to all the bits and things you've absorbed from outside and you can just recombine in other ways. So one second, I'll share my screen. Okay, 
So these are the questions we just looked at. Um, what kind of thing is faith? Right, so that's the question we're going to look at in this um, paragraph right here. and be probably my favorite paragraph from the book. Um, but when we're talking about what kind of thing is faith, the question is about, is it basically, is it the same as knowledge or isn't it something else, right? Does it, to have faith mean to um, know that a certain thing is true or is it just different from knowing in some fundamental way? So here's Russell Vajic's take on that. He says, there are no simple, there's simply no cognitive categories in which the total commitment of the man of faith could be spelled out, right? It's not like a rational thing. This commitment is rooted not in one dimension, such as the rational one, but in the whole personality of the man of faith. The whole of the human being, the rational as well as the non-rational aspects, is committed to God. Hence, the magnitude of the commitment is beyond the comprehension of the logos and the ethos. So logos, it means both words and sort of thinking, and ethos means the, the will to act, to act in a certain way. The act of faith is aboriginal, without origin, exploding with elemental force as an all-consuming and all-pervading eudaimonic passional experience in which most of our, our most secret urges, aspirations, fears, and passions, at times even unsuspected by us, manifest themselves. Right? It's something that wells up within us, eudaimonic, meaning having to do with human flourishing, passional, meaning having to do with emotions, um, in which urges, aspirations, fears, and passions make themselves known. The commitment of the man of faith is thrown into the mold of the in-depth personality and immediately accepted before the mind is given a chance to investigate the reasonableness of this unqualified commitment. The intellect does not chart the course of the man of faith. Its role is an a posteriori one, meaning coming after the fact. It attempts ex post facto, also after the fact, to retrace the footsteps of the man of faith. And even in this modest attempt, the intellect is not completely successful. I know there's a lot I'm reading through the paragraph. We're going to go back and break it down a little bit. Um, it, it attempts to retrace the footsteps of faith. The mind does. Of course, as long as the path of the man of faith cuts across the territory of the reasonable, the intellect may follow him and identify his footsteps. The very instant, however, the man of faith transcends the frontiers of the reasonable and enters into the realm of the unreasonable, the intellect is left behind and must terminate its search for understanding. The man of faith is animated by his great experience, uh, man of faith animated by his great experience is able to reach the point which not only his logic of the mind, but even his logic of the heart and of the will, everything, even his own eye awareness has to give in to an absurd commitment. The man of faith is insanely committed to and madly in love with God, right? So we sort of go get more intense as we go on here. We start from there's no cognitive categories to it's beyond the comprehension of the logos and ethos, then it's the aboriginal explosion of emotions from within the self, and ultimately it's insanity and lovesick madness. Um, or the next line after this is a quote from Shir Hashirim about being lovesick. And, um, and so that's like one obvious aspect is the, the emphasis here on emotion. Faith is an emotion rather than a, um, uh, a thought, a thing you know. But also I've highlighted here throughout um, the word commitment or committed, which shows up eight times in this one paragraph. It is also a key word running throughout the book and a lot of Rosalvechik's writings on this topic, right? The sense of being committed to something, that you have something which you uh, value, which you um, value almost even the wrong way to conscious. You are... <laughs> um, bound to it in some significant way. You b want to affirm it. You want to be engaged with it. You want to be involved with it. And so, right, the la in the end of this paragraph, it's God. But in this book, it's also halacha, right? That you are deeply committed to certain practices beyond any question of like, what are they for? And we'll come back to that next class. Um, and the sense of you didn't decide rationally to choose this lifestyle to live this kind of life, uh, if you just feel like it's right and you you have no real ability to um, rationalize your way out of that because that would be a category area. You could think all, all day and all night about is this the right thing or the wrong thing, but that doesn't actually touch the sort of um, what you call the deeper layer of the self, right? You have to hit the mold of the in-depth personality that is involved here. That there's some deeper aspect of us. And I'll note here is an in-depth personality. It's also about the whole personality and the faith that uh, rationality for us, Slovakia, we're talking about what it means to be a human being. 
rationality is just one aspect of who we are. And he's not going to deny that. We talked last week about the uh, this is the way the book is structured on Adam 1 and Adam 2, as these two aspects, what it means to be a whole human being. Right? So the whole human being does involve rationality, and we're going to talk about that a little more in a minute. But this is the depth of the human being, and it's the part of the human being we often are inclined to sort of leave out of our discussion, is the way that we feel committed to certain Things. We we think certain things are good and you know right and we we uh, like them and we want to be involved with them engage with them. Often we can't even explain why. Uh, and he says that you know there is such a thing as trying to explain this after the fact. The intellect charts does not chart the course. Its role is an a posteriori one, right? We can after the fact explain why uh, a life of faith is a good one or um, a life of commitment to any you know social framework or, or a set of practices or beliefs that we're committed to you know, we can explain why it's a good one for us but he said that's always um it's an attempt to explain our, ourselves to ourselves rather than it's actually deciding who we're going to be right so put the question what is the difference between faith and knowledge it's that it's that knowledge is something you can arrive at in a conscious process uh versus faith is those things that are at times even unsuspected by us, right? They well up from within us in ways that aren't always obvious. Um, and for something that means to be a person is to have um, elements that are, at the very least, not super conscious, right? You could say un the unconscious, you want to be uh, a psychoanalytic vein, but it's to have elements of yourself that um, go deeper than what you're thinking about at any given moment and the thing, the sort of knowledge you've learned. Right? is some part of you that is deeper than just um, the things you've learned and thought about. Uh, and part of that's going to be important also, because when we move on, we'll see there's a social aspect to this as well, which is this question is, can what um, can you communicate or can you not communicate will be connected to a question of uh, what can you know versus what do you believe? Right. So this is, uh, we're going to look for a second at what's sort of opposed to um, to this model of faith. Um, but actually for a second, I wanna stop and just see if there's any questions. Because that I think is in some ways uh, the tough core of the book and the class. Everything else was sort of fleshing this out. Um, but if there are questions at this moment, I'm very happy to stop and do some explanatory work. I see a few questions that came up in chat. One from uh, Lindsay asking, do we know whether the Rav was familiar with psychoan psychoanalytic theories and thinkers? And what role does culture play in developing ingrained unconscious faith? Very good questions. Um, the second one we're going to talk about a little bit as we go on, and then a little more also next class. Um, in terms of what he's familiar with, um, he references Freud a couple times, um, but also more likely in some ways than like psychoanalytic thinking is a movement that starts in the 50s and 60s called uh, existential psychology in many ways, pushing back against psychoanalysis in some ways, um, but in some way also maintaining similar theories of the self as more than just uh, rationality. Um, and yeah, the figures like Rollo May and stuff are involved in that, and that's more likely sort of the direct influence on him, uh, essential psychology. Yeah. Uh, I see in the chat someone saying it's similar to most of our commitments, not just religious faith. And I would say like, yeah, like what makes in some ways faith religious is um, the content of it as opposed to just the uh, the structure of it. The structure of it is the structure of uh, commitment, <laughs> the structure of uh, like a psychological language, like desire, the things that pull you from deep within yourself, from in your bones in some ways, from more than just your, your rational choices of what makes sense. Okay, so that we're gonna oppose to the discussion of Adam one in uh, Lonely Man of Faith. Okay, this is from near the beginning of the book. Um, is there is no doubt the term image of God in the first account refers to man's inner charismatic endowment as a creative being. So first off, this is him giving a, a definition of uh, the phrase Talmud Elohim, image of God. You can tuck that away in your, your uh, you know, Torah pouch. That he's, uh, this is a way of thinking about the phrase from the first chapter of Rashi, what does it mean to be the image of God? to be a creative being. Um, charismatic here, uh, not a way we use the word now, has to do with the word charity, thing like that. So gift, of, this thing is charismatic, but as a way, it's a gift from God. 
uh, you know, sort of divine grace. The man's, uh, you know, the charismatic endowment that God has given us that makes us a creative being. Man's likeness to God expresses itself in man's striving and ability to become a creator. God, in imparting the blessing to Adam the first and giving the mandate to subdue nature, directed Adam's attention to the functional and practical aspects of his intellect, through which man is able to gain control of nature, right? It's not just about intellect in sort of the broad sense. Uh, it's intellect specifically, we talked about the last time, in like a technological sense, the ability to uh, subdue nature, to be functional and practical and think in, uh, to, to study nature in order to know how to use it, how to replicate it to better human life and society. Modern science has emerged victorious from its encounter with nature because it has sacrificed the qualitative metaphysical speculation for the sake of functional duplication of reality, right? It's not about just trying to uh, know what's out there, qualitative metaphysical speculation. Science is about, uh, you know, copying reality in order to make things that work, right? It's not about uh, string theory or multiple worlds theory. It's about uh, figuring out how to turn certain chemicals into LED lights in order to make phone screens. Um, like it's the uh, focus is always practical and um, to use a fancy word, anthropocentric, like human oriented. In a natural community which knows no prayer, Majestic Adam can offer only his accomplishments, not himself. And this is where um, it's going to be important. And I, after I read these, I'll flesh out a little bit back to the AI conversation. But the focus on rationality and practical rationality he shapes the kind of, which is, you know, that you can't pray, he says, but also it's going to shape the kind of community we can create. Right, the uh, you can offer only your accomplishments, not yourself. There is certainly, even within the framework of natural community, as essentialists are want to say, a dialogue between the I and the thou. Right, the natural community is not antisocial, and in fact, in some ways, the natural community, the rational out of one community, is the most social. That the is going to be something particularly social about it. However, this dialogue may only gratify the necess necessity for communication, which urges Adam the first to relate himself to others since communication for him means information about the surface activity of practical man, right? Surface versus the depth we saw before. Such dialogue certainly cannot quench the burning thirst for communication in the depth of Adam II, who will always remain a homo absconditus if the majestic logoi of Adam I should serve as the only medium of expression, right? Homo uh, from human or, you know, homo sapiens, um, absconditus to abscond to hide oneself, that if the conversation is always only happening on the level of Adam the first and logo again means like words here or ideas or thoughts. Um, the, if it's only about rationality and success, then Adam the second, the person of faith, the person who has a, a is identifies with the commitments that that don't make sense, that aren't practical, that don't lead to accomplishments. Um, then he has no room for that. And I'll mention that the um, New York Times uh, editorial writer David Brooks years ago wrote a piece about Lonely Man of Faith where he defined Adam one values as his resume values and Adam two values as um, eulogy values, right? The kind of things you're going to put on a resume are Adam one things, the kind of things you're going to hear about in a eulogy are going to be Adam two things, right? The things that aren't accomplishments you use to sell yourself to other people, but they are in fact the things that we might at the end of the day say are the most important. Um, what really can this dialogue reveal of the numinous in-depth personality? Nothing. Yes, words are spoken, but these words reflect not the unique and intimate, but the universal and public in man. As Homo absconditus is a hidden person, right? Adam II is not capable of telling his personal experiential story in majestic formal terms. His emotional life is inseparable from his unique modus existential, his way of being. And therefore, if communicated to the thou, to the, the other person, only as a piece of surface information, it's unintelligible, right? When you try and explain to someone in terms of, you know, utility, what your faith is about, it just ends up not making any sense to them. This story belongs exclusively to Adam II. It is his and only his, and it would make no sense if it disclosed to others. Distress and bliss, joys and frustrations are incommunicable within the framework of natural dialogue consisting of common words. By the time Homo absconditus manages to deliver the message, the personal and intimate content of the latter is already recast in the lingual matrix, which standardizes the unique and universalizes the individual. This is that if you try and talk about 
um, faith, but yeah, not just faith, as um, Daniel pointed out, as sort of any of your commitments about the things that are truly valuable to you, you end up being very reductive about them, about what they're valuable for, because for you, they're just fundamentally valuable. But when you said others, someone else who doesn't value them in the same way, you're going to have to explain why they're valuable. And so one way, one example for me is, is like, why are families valuable? Right? Well, you and I'm sort of bracketing the question of, say, uh, families that aren't working well, um, but you might feel deeply committed to your family in a way that actually goes deeper than the specific questions of, um, you know, are they rationally valuable to you? And if you hear someone give an a evolutionary explanation for like why family structures are valuable um, or a sociological explanation, that'll seem strange to you. But on the flip side, if you try to explain you know, when you're saying to someone else, what you're doing essentially for Slovakic is taking a, a deep value and rendering it into dialogue that is legible to everyone else, uh, legible on a, on a very sort of social level, but by definition is going to miss the depth. You can't really capture the depth. And when you uh, try, you end up just flattening it all anyways. It all becomes surface. Um, I want to read one more, uh, we'll go in a second. Um, so this is all again in contrast to uh, the discussion of faith. Um, but for the question of AI, right, is what is AI doing? Again, is AI um, committed to anything? Or is AI all words and accomplishments, right? Is it, does it live in the level of the social and the shared? Or does it, is it strongly committed to one thing or another? And um, there's, you know, it's an open question, including because this is a developing field. Um, there's a lot to say to the fact that it's typically AI won't, if you really, so art AI works less well with this, right? You can't ask AI, art AI to take a stand. But if you use um, uh, text generating AI that can answer questions for you, more often than not, they will refuse to take, to take a stand. You can push them to take a stand on questions of like debates about philosophy, like, you know, between Plato and Aristotle, who's right on the question of the reality of ideas, something like that. They won't give you answers to those sorts of questions. Um, and so one way of thinking about that is, well, yeah, they're just incapable of it because they don't, aren't committed to anything. They don't have commitments. Another way of thinking about it is that they're also, that comes down to, to programming, that they're in fact programmed not to have commitments. Right. And so that's also related to which I last time about technology being in many ways a, um, for lack of a better word, a money making endeavor, right? Like the, the companies making them are not in, uh, incentivized to take stands on random philosophical questions, um, but they want to have access and we want to be accessible to as broad an audience as possible. And right, I hope you're hearing the universal and the public in man. If you're going to be taking commitments and making committed stands on things that are open questions, there's not like an obvious right or wrong, then you're going to be alienating some people and not others, right? And so this is why Roslovagic talks about faith and existential commitments as the source of loneliness in some ways. And we'll see uh, another thing that might make you lonely, way it might make you lonely, but um, existential commitments are things that are by definition not shared by everyone. And so it will create a degree of alienation between yourself and other people. Uh, and so um, for my part, I'm um, partisan towards the sense of the question of programming is really important here. That when people make AI, um, they're making them in such a way that they couldn't possibly be uh, committed to anything. And I think that's important. Um, and part of that's important, um, you know, I just want to read this piece, uh, it will help sort of, I think, flesh out the contrast way of thinking about what it means. This is, is going to push in the opposite direction. This is from Halachic Man from a Slovakic. It's a much earlier, uh, piece of writing. It, the two don't sit well together, Halachic Man and Lonely of Faith for exactly this reason, because of everything we've read so far about what it means to have faith versus this, uh, piece of Slovakic is defining tshuva, defining repentance. He says, the severing of one's psychic identity with one's previous I and the creation of a new I, possessor of a new consciousness, a new heart and spirit, different desires, longings, goals. This is the meaning of that repentance compounded of regret over the past and resolve for the future. 
The sinner terminates his past identity, assumes a new identity for the future. It is a creative gesture which is responsible for the emergence of a new personality, a new self. This creative gesture is precipitated by an absolute decision of the will and intellect together. Uh, the desire to be another person, to be different than I am now, is the central motif of repentance. And just um, jumping down to, uh, yeah, jumping down the line, a person is created, he was endowed with the power to create at his very inception. When he finds himself in a situation of sin, he takes advantage of creative capacity, and returns to God, becomes a creator and a self-fashioner. Man, through repentance, creates himself, creates his own I. Right? And so, in the Lament of Faith, in Halakhic Man, what it means to be a person, uh, to be sort of this, you can hear the echo of Adam 1, of the creative self endowed by God with creative ability, is to be a fully programmable self, right? You get to choose your new heart and spirit, different desires, longings, goals, right? You get to choose um, who you are and what you are. And so for a lonely man of faith, um, which I think uh, certainly on questions of technology is uh, much more sensitive to both, you know, technology and issues of what it means to be a person, um, they just, what it means to be a person is to be something deeper than this. In the language of only man of faith, a man is all surface. It's all what you can totally change and rearrange. And all of these things are theoretically shareable with all people, right? There's, you don't have some sort of deep commitment that you yourself even can't rearrange. I want to decide if how much of this we're going to do. I have a uh, uh, little bit of a pathological desire to give two minutes texts and work through them, um, but also, uh, you know, we can skip them if we want. Uh, I'd rather mm -hmm. skip them than, um, than get stuck in them. Um, so I will just summarize outside this next section, which I think is valuable. Uh, dignity versus redemption is one of the binaries Rav Salvatic uses for thinking about uh, Adam 1 and Adam 2. Um, and they're used in ways that are not necessarily so intuitive. Um, here in Adam 1, you find a, sort of the intuitive definition of dignity. Dignity is an uh, important part of what it means to be human. It means to have power over your existence, right? So the uh, philosophers of modernity and enlightenment say that enlightenment is, is Kant, that when uh, man takes himself out of his self-imposed immaturity, when we learned to take control of our destiny and save ourselves from, you know, sort of a brutish existence in the world, right? The brute's existence. Um, the sense of like, well, we can make medicine and technology to make our lives better. Um, we can explore the world, those sorts of things. Um, and he says also, dignity is a social and behavioral category. That dignity is always relative to other people. Right there, you are more or less dignified. You find yourself on a scale of dignity, um, you know, a little bit in your own life, more or less, as you become more mature and more capable. Um, you become, but also as the expectation of maturity and dignity rises, then you are more abased and undignified when you don't live up to it. Right when, um, when like babies um, are, you know, spilling all over themselves. That's not a sign of being undignified, it's not being a baby, versus an adult who's doing it might feel undignified, uh, particularly if they were seen doing that by other people, right? Dignity is about the ways in which you are seen and social, and right? So, and this is why I wanted to at least talk about this, is it puts it in line with the questions from before about sociality. Um, and I think one question that this touches on, uh, as well as the question of redemption, we'll get to in a second, but like, can robots be dignified or undignified? Right. And so that also has to do with the question of um, expectations and freedom. What do we expect from them? Um, these sorts of things. Um, but he contrasts all of that with uh, redemption. Right. And so this is, is just one paragraph. Uh, there's a lot more in the book about it. It's cathartic redemptiveness, a sense of uh, when you experience a sense of redemption, which creates a sense of uh, relief, you might say, uh, from a sense of a, a of um undignifiedness in your uh, in-depth personality. We'll you, cathartic redemptiveness is experienced in the privacy of one's in-depth personality. And it cuts below the relationship between the I and the thou, to use an existentialist term, and it reaches into the very hidden strata of the isolated I who knows himself as a singular being, right? That what it means to be redeemed 
for a subject first and foremost is to dig down towards a level of the self that is fully antisocial in some sense, right? Um, it's beneath the relationship with the I and thou. It's in contrast to the social dignity, which is connected to the the uh, capacity for speech that we saw before. The speech is something that's an atom one thing. It's full of success and um, things like that. Um, and finding yourself on a level below that. When objectified in personal and emotional categories, meaning when you when you try and put it into um, like language, what that feels like, it expresses itself in the feeling of axiological security. Axiological, fancy word or somebody likes, meaning having to do with value. Um, in this case, it means either um, the sense of I have value, even though I can't justify myself in dignified terms. I just uh, like satisfied in who I am. Potentially also means I'm secure in my values, in the things to which I'm committed, even though I can't justify other people, I feel secure in them. The individual intuits its existence as worthwhile, legitimate, and adequate, anchored in something stable and unchangeable, right? You sense that I'm not this self that I could just whip around and turn into whoever society wants me to be. I am a real being with presence in the world, with significance. Even this is sort of um, the dignified model has COVID, weight, gravitas um, that you achieve in society. But if you can set aside social concerns for a second, for a second or so, Vajic says, you can accept yourself. You can reach down to who am I inside and accept that as a, a real sort of thing. Um, and to get towards um, the question from, um, I'm very sorry, I've forgotten the name of the person who asked it, um, about the relationship between um, society, and uh, Lindsay's question, about society and faith. Um, we're going to see that he, he does think that you, um, your faith is influenced by your society. In fact, it's, it, there is a way in which it is deeply societal. Um, this is, I've called the next section, two forms of individualism and two forms of community that counterintuitively, there is a way in which it's actually very important to be a part of a community, um, for a person of faith, a person who has commitments. In fact, I would argue that it's impossible not to be in a community. Um, but I want to look for that two lines from this passage from a uh, essay from Adam and Eve and call, uh, called Adam and Eve in Family Redeemed. Uh, I've forgotten to put to the end of this source a citation. I'll try and uh, send that later if anyone wants it. Um, family Redeemed is a book of essays on um, marriage and family life and, you know, parents and children and all kinds of things like that. Uh, some really great essays. This is the very first one. And it's about um, Adam and Eve as paradigmatic of like human existence writ large, and then also of human relationships and of community in general. For, for us, the word community means anything from like two people together to potentially all human beings, but certainly any like collective group. Um, and so he talks a lot today about what that means, um, but he says here, uh, there is homo absconditus, a hidden man to whom no, whom no one knows, right? Human beings, are defined, he's defined in contrast to like nature that you can just study scientifically. Human beings are defined by having a depth, right? So far, so similar. He hardly knows himself. There's something about you that's, you know, mysterious. Hence, in spite of watching man's activity and little knowledge, the latter is a mystery which no one can unravel. Here he says, all men are liars, says the psalmist, not because they want to tell the untruth. They are simply unable to tell the truth. Right, as I see my neighbor every morning, leave his house at six thirty. I know where he drives off. I'm familiar with his occupation. I know what he'll do when he his place of business. Uh, I willy nilly watch his conduct. Willy nilly meaning against my will. It's a, a phrase which Vajic likes a lot. Um, but I don't know him. He says um, he was a mystery to me. The uniqueness of the persona can't ever be manifest. Right. So this is Rosalie's most intense version of this, and I think it's actually a more intense than he is in Lonely Man of Faith. The idea that you Ensemble cannot tell the truth when it comes to your emotional commitments, right? And I think part of that is about if you, you know, want to try and put them together and say that he there really is saying the same thing here as in Lonely Man of Faith is because if you were to try and explain your values and your commitments even to yourself, it would be a little bit untrue. It's, it's so far as you said, this is why I believe what I believe. This is why I care about what I care about you wouldn't be able to do that. 
um, like that would not be why. You could say, this is what it means to me or something, or this is how I experience it. He says, you, you can walk the path backwards or retroactively um, to figure that out, but you can't ever give the, the deepest explanation of why you care about these things because they are um, they are just beyond you and beyond language. Um, so that is, is in the, the most intense version of society versus the individual. But in Lonely Man of Faith, um, here are in fact two forms of community in, alongside the two types of people he talks about or two aspects of the person. Adam the second is we're going to look at for the next 10, 12 minutes till the end of the class. Um, and we can take questions after that. Um, this is going I to, to bring up a question. I just want to bring up a question that came up in chat before it gets a little too. Um, okay, so one second, I'm going to just lay out the last thought. Um, we're going to get to the way that your commitment both flows from community. We'll talk more about that next time but also um, shapes a certain kind of community. That Lonely Man of Faith is often thought of as a book about like loneliness, about what it means to be a person. But I think in many, many ways, it's really about this question of how do we take this sense of what, what kind of people we are um, and make communities where that is possible. Yeah. Uh, Kayla, you have a question? Uh, yes, the question I wanted to highlight in the chat is from Daniel Mashinsky. Mashinsky. AI is committed to the goals it's programmed to do. Um, some agents are trained to be impartial and non-committed as quote customer service agents, but others are trained to embody more committed personas. Uh, Daniel, did I get that right? Yeah, so um, if I understand the question asked, this is how much of um, this, I think part of why I try to flesh out some of the different options above is exactly because um, when we use the phrase AI, it captures too much, right? There are too many different things. We all sort of call the same thing, um, really technically, um, when, like when people who, who get very serious about the conversation, um, we'll use the phrase artificial general intelligence to mean something like what we see in movies or of AI. I think that would be what a person is, right? Uh, as opposed to all the little AIs and some of the little intelligence that are localized to different things and have different purposes and different designs um, set in line with those purposes. Uh, so I think I this is where I raised the different options before. The way we're ha I'm having this conversation right now is differentiating between two different types of being, of existence, of existence that is programmable, that is uh, a you know compilation of data that could be uploaded to the cloud, as it were, versus the existence of commitments and values and, and concerns that couldn't. And you can't, like, ahead of time, say AI will always, all, all the time, in every instance, fit into one of both of those categories, right? Or, um, you have to look at every instance before you and figure out which one does this fit into. Um, and I... This is both a uh, an analytical tool, right? It's useful for um, asking what is it that I'm seeing, the thing I'm looking at, this technology, what does it actually do? How does it work? It's also a uh, prescriptive tool, right? If you're someone who actually is interested in creating um, what they call artificial general intelligence, uh, what I would think, I was um, say I would call it an artificial person, well, then you have to have a goal in mind with that, right? What where is the end goal? What is the destination of the road you're trying to walk down? Like set aside, is it possible or not possible? Like what are you trying to do? And so I would say, if you're trying to make an artificial person, then actually the sort of hardwiring in of certain values or something like hardwiring in of certain values um, is actually a critical part of that. And I think that if we met someone who is a robot walking around who um, didn't care about anything in specific, but didn't have their hard code advice, then like we would actually have trouble um, identifying them as a person. That would feel very strange to us. Um, it also leads to some sort of interesting paradoxical things, such as in sci-fi where there are rules placed in, like sort of hardwired into robots in order to protect people. That is in some ways the ways in which they become the most like people in some ways. Um, hope that is helpful to that question. So I'm going to talk about the the type of community that um, Adam the Second creates, um, that what it means to create a community as a person who cares deeply. I think it's a person of faith. 
Um, and so this is what Rosvija calls uh, the prayerful community. He has a couple of different words for it. Uh, the prayerful community, the uh, so called the uh, covenantal community, the covenant of the community of faith. Um, you contrast it with, you know, the work community, the political community, the, the sociality of Adam the first. The prayerful community must not likewise remain a twofold affair, a transient eye addressing himself to eternal heat, right? So you actually have to create community. The inclusion of others is indispensable. Man should avoid himself praying for himself alone. Um, this is from a section of the book where he focuses on prayer, but in doing so, attempts to flesh out this prayerful community, right? Through the lens of prayer, what sort of community is it does, does uh, Adam the second create? The plural form of prayer is a central halakhic significance. When disaster strikes, one must not be immersed completely in his own passional destiny, thinking exclusively of himself, but concerned only with himself and petitioning God merely for himself. The foundation of a fictitious uh, and noble prayer is human solidarity and sympathy for the covenantal awareness of existential togetherness, of sharing and experiencing the travail and suffering of those for whom majestic Adam the first has no concern. Only Adam the second knows the art of praying as he confronts God with the petition of the many. That what it means to be in any, you might call an existential community, is to be in a community where you know that everyone else around you has faith, which is they has things that you don't understand, right? You might often think of a faith community as well, we all know and agree to the same things. We all have the, the same list of dogmas that we all agree on and we can pull out our catechisms and compare them and we all they're all the same and what you're saying actually the deepest level of a faith community is a community where you know this other person has stuff you don't understand that we are together in our lack of comprehension for each other whereas adam the first community is designed around mutual understanding and mutual dialogue and mutual um like instrumentalization. We all are working together. We all understand each other, what we're there for. Um, we can get things done together, right? We've put all of the important parts of ourselves into a agreement together. We've written down and that's how the community works, right? It's a business deal. It's a social contract. Um, it's a the founding of a religious community. And if you were here last time, you recall, Russell Vichy contrasts the religious community with the community of faith. Right. So that's one way of community. And for the sort of the community of faith, the, the deep community he wants to create is about human solidarity and sympathy and awareness of existential togetherness, of being together in the travail and suffering of those for whom Majestic Adam the first has no concern, of being someone, of recognizing that other people around you also have this, that they're committed to things that don't fit into the broader social order that don't fit into a society obsessed with success. And um, like, it's hard to avoid the fact that he was living in the sixties in America and just moments of burgeoning wealth for huge parts of society, but also in the time of the, um, the moon landing, like he is very aware of technology and society and business as signs of human power and really defining po like popular culture. Um, and he says, we have to be able to create at the very least sub communities within our society where you recognize that people don't always live that way. The community of the committed became ipso facto, sort of by, by default, a community of friends. And friends, like much like the word community for Absolvagic, um, does not have always the intuitive meaning. It can mean anything from two people together to uh, sort of the broadest possible collective of human beings. Uh, friendship, he's going to give it his definition, definition here, is not the same as we sort of typically think of it, right? A community of friends, not of neighbors or acquaintances. Friendship, not as a social surface relationship, but as an existential in-depth relation between two individuals is realizable only within the framework of the covenantal community where in-depth personalities relate themselves to each other ontologically and total commitment to God and fellow man is the order of the day, right? A community wherein you can be around other people and this is agreed upon sort of advance that we're going to be okay with the the weird parts of ourselves, the um, the parts of ourselves that don't go, you know, fit well in a social media feed. Um, the and I was talking with a student years ago who noted that um, in many ways, in for a lot of people on social media, it is now uh, a valuable thing to do that receives social accolades um, to post your losses and your the things that make you suffer. A weird sort of 
dynamics emerge where that itself can be a form of, of creating a, a socially valuable self, a self that is accepted by the Adam One community. Um, and that's sort of an interesting dynamic. Um, he saw it as a sort of the capturing of even this aspect of, of Adam Two by Adam One, the sort of appropriation of it. I think you might also say it means that um, their Adam First community, the community that's based on success, on on posting, you know, you're just uh, if you're going LinkedIn, where just people posting their their the things that work that have uh, gone well for them, like that, making space for for a more complicated type of person. Is in the majestic community where surface personalities meet and commitment never exceeds the bounds of the utilitarian, we may find collegiality, neighborliness, civil or courtesy, but not friendship, which is the exclusive experience awarded by God to covenantal man, who's thus redeemed from his agonizing solitude. Right. The, and I'm just bringing this back, the idea of redemption, that um, when we talked about earlier redemptiveness, about the ability to recognize your own uh, commitments and be okay with them, Part of the way that works is through redemptive dialogue, which we're going to talk about next class more. Um, but here's the start. It was not just on the person to person dialogue level, but as a community, making a space for people who have parts of that have commitments and values that transcend utility, that transcend rationality, um, that go deeper than, than those sorts of questions. Um, the first form of redemption comes from being able to find a, a space for yourself in that sort of community, right? The community is necessary for this sort of ongoing existence as long as the community where you can find space for it. I want to take questions on all of that, but we're almost done. So I want to read the last source first, because this will also open up a, a, a final aspect of the question of what it means to be a person, um, which is essentially the question of self-perception. Uh, not just, are you committed to things? But how do you see yourself and do you locate yourself within a broader world? And there's a, uh, a philosopher who decades and decades ago, and Herbert Dreyfus, um, he's a, uh, a philosopher and a, a scholar of the, uh, the Nazi philosopher, you know, Shimo, Martin Heidegger, who um, he, um, wrote a book called Good Old Fashioned AI or something like that, where he argues that because of this question of how do you locate yourself within a world, actually AI is just physically, like, it's impossible, it couldn't be done. Um, there's been lots of responses to him since then. Um, but it's a um, it's because of this sort of question it is the ex existential insecurity of Adam the second stems to a great extent also from his tragic role as a temporal being right the fact that we know that we are finite and will not last forever he simply cannot pinpoint his position within the rushing stream of time in the covenantal community man of faith finds deliverance from his isolation in the now for the latter contains both before and after every covenantal time experience is both retrospective reconstructing and reliving the bygone as well as prospective, anticipating the about to be. This is to live in a community is to not be just a person who was born, lives, and dies, because you are born into an ongoing story, and you know that the story continues on after you. You are part of something bigger than yourself, not just in the present, where there's more people around you, but also you, you know, draw on something that comes from behind you, as it were, and project it forward into the future. Right. He uh, calls this the Judaic Masora community, Masora being he words for tradition about and particularly having to do with passing on like the transmission community, you might say, uh, and says that to be part of the, the Masora community is to see yourself part of a chain stretching back to uh, the very least Har Sinai, even the Avot, and stretching forward into sort of the messianic future and to be committed to that stretching in both directions and passing on that you uh, receive from those who came before you and pass on to those who came after you. Well, part of what that means is that to be a person in the, the deepest sense of it, to not simply be a, a surface person, is not just to have a depth, but also to be in a context that you are aware of and you see a shape in you, that you are going to be someone who exists at one part of a much larger picture. And part of the question is, to what degree AI can do that? And not just in terms of like, are they part of a broader context? Because actually, as we sort of talked about at the beginning in terms of machine learning, the way that works actually is by absorbing as much context as possible. But the question is then, what do you do then? How do you see yourself? And do you see yourself just as someone who um, has full, full of content or is in fact see yourself as part of a uh, spatial and temporal world around you? Um, so just to run through some of these questions, what does it mean to be a person? Does artificial intelligence possess that quality? Could it, um, I've been so far, I think most, uh, what it means to be a person is to have 
uh, deep commitments that defy your own attempt to really sort of understand them so completely that you could choose otherwise, that you could say, well, this is the reason I don't agree with it. Um, in fact, it's the kind of commitments that structure what you would and wouldn't agree with. Um, and I so far have yet to see any evidence of any sort of artificial intelligence that has that, though I've talked about how I think programming could in some sense create something like that potentially. Um, does anybody have surface and depth? Is it dignified in need of redemption? Um, this need of redemption also gets down to the question of um, self-perception, right? Do you feel yourself as inadequate some ways, as being supposed to be one way and actually being another, not living up to something? Um, and I think this is one of those things that's a, a hard question to know, right? This goes after the Turing test question of could you know if you had a person, a machine expressing that, um, that, that it felt undignified, would that be enough to make you think it's a person? Um, this is the kind of thing that philosophers that I work on, and you really sort of push them. Again, I've yet to see convincing evidence that uh, artificial intelligence does or could have a sense of self in that way. Uh, what does it mean to belong to a community? Could AI belong to the natural community? What about covenantal community? Can it have a sense of past and future? Um, and simply just to address this part, I think I've, I've addressed the others well enough, but could it belong to a natural community? In some sense, the model of machine learning uh, typifies the natural community and then the sociality of Adam one that's based on surface level communication of shareable public universalizable facts. Like those are the kind, those are the bread and butter of um, Adam the, uh, as well, Adam the first of the majestic community, the natural community. Uh, and the first seems to, and AI seems to work really well on that. And it's also why I think not accidental that like AI has phenomenal applications for everything Adam the first is good at business, politics, like that. Like it, it has a very practical ability to like look at all the things that are around and tell you what's out there. Um, but um, that is very different from some we talked about so far. So that I'm going to stop and share. Um, really love any sort of thoughts, questions people have. Um, yeah. A lot of uh, com a lot of uh, back some back and forth in the chat while you were teaching um, from Lindsay saying, I'm definitely seeing shades of Martin Buber here. He's talking about connection, friendship and shared values on an I thou level, which from how I'm reading this can only be done through shared values and faith. How does this idealized faith community cope with dissent or conflict? Yeah, so first off, A plus on the Boober. Uh, I was hoping someone would mention that. Um, Boober's definitely in the background here, like I thou language is basically popularized by Boober or by the translation of Boober into English. Um, Roslovacic is deeply indebted to Boober in a lot of ways that he doesn't show up in footnotes, uh, in part because he doesn't have a lot of, he's not like citing sources for the most part. Um, but uh, like, yeah, Boober is, is in this. Um, this is one of those things that I have only as like six or seven degrees of hearsay or rumor that Roslovacic referred to only man of faith as like an orthodox version of I and thou. Um, I don't have to say that's true or not, but that's definitely in here, uh, in that, in the, like the, the idea of like sort of a depth person and those sorts of things. Um, how does this idealized faith community cope with dissent or conflict is a really good question. Um, and unfortunately it's not one I think Roslovacic really deals with, except for like, one is that part of that gets into the question of authority, which we're not going to deal with so much, but he does very like with this Masora community based on passing down from teachers to students essentially creates a structure, uh, a, student, a student teacher structure. Um, and he has like two places where he acknowledges that that can be problematic about this sort of issue. Um, broadly speaking, he uh, thinks that you should, that teachers should be, you know, teaching people. And so they, they shouldn't be trying to force them to do anything, but they should teach them to act in some way or other. If that doesn't work, then like they shouldn't be trying to force them back into line. And he seems to have been broadly open to students dissenting from him. Um, but the other thing I'll say is, and this is something we're going to look at next week, um, we saw what I call the programmable self model of, of repentance, right? The idea of chuba as sort of, you can just make yourself who you are. Um, we're going to see another model. And we talk about the religious community as a form of Adam one community, because once you're do, once you say that sociality is always about sort of success, then trying to create another form of sociality, you can't rule it out entirely. And the, as I said, the, um, the piece from Adam and Eve family redeemed draws out like a very strict line and those lines don't sort of hold up. So we're gonna do a little bit in the next class and the next, and the, the last one is in some ways read Rav Soloveitchik against himself 
and the ways that his sort of strict lines don't hold up. And he actually, he says some things that if you take, if you read what he did, are a little more radical. So like, I think he would say, in fact, not only, do, like he doesn't give good answers to sort of how this faith community might cope with this inter conflict, but I think he's gonna say it has to, that there is no option for not having this inter conflict. This is gonna touch also on uh, Daniel's question here I'm seeing about like people don't live up to his high ideals. That's definitely true. Um, and I'll get to the they're still human part of that in a second. Um, the but the um the book is about you know trying to encourage people to live up to a certain ideal and to create a certain kind of community that can make space for so the the uh sort of crescendo of the book in chapter nine is saying like Adam the first in the modern era makes no space for Adam the second. The 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 state and society don't have room for people who have faith, who have like fundamental commitments that don't or aren't socially useful. Um, and saying we need to make societies and communities that have room for those sorts of things. Um, and so that will will come through next. And we talk about the halacha community as needing to create uh, some sort of um, society that um, that can make space for dissent and conflict, that like difference from that community itself. Um, in terms of them still being human, uh, Adam and uh, Daniel, your question, um, that's true. That gets down to a, a broader problem I haven't really talked about, which is any attempt to uh, define what it means to be a person, including Rav Silvachik's, will run into the problem of um, different kinds of people. And we're like all um, generally committed to calling them people, right? So um, people who um, like from all spans of, of the human lifespan, from the moment of birth to the moment of death, to all spans of uh, cognitive and emotional uh, ability and intent, like willful ability of will. Like there are so many different kinds of people. And every time you try and give a definition, I've yet to see one that uh, captures all of that without um, being just like, oh, it has human DNA. Um, and so one argument might be the actual endeavor of trying to define what a person is, is uh, doomed to some degree, uh, that'll never be viable. Uh, and then you can ask, is it still valuable maybe? And I happen to think that like Rav Soloveitchik's argument for the importance of seeing a person as someone who has depth defined by fundamental commitments is very valuable. It captures something really important about being a person. It also enables the sort of critique of like societies that don't make room fundamental commitments and and depth and difference um, that I think is important. But I think like if you actually say, well, this is what it means to be a person, uh, you'd run into the problem of like, well, you find people who don't live up to that, uh, including what you like critiques people who are saying who who live totally for the resume, as it were, and not for any sort of fundamental commitments. Um, and he would say, like, they're not living up to being human, but they, he wouldn't say they're not humans anymore, as you put it. I hope that helps. Um, <laughs> Just want to highlight in chat what Lindsay wrote <clears throat> saying, yeah. just for anyone who's not following along in chat, um, hearing what you are saying, it has me thinking about rupture and reconstruction and how Haim Salvechik's ideas about cultural reproduction and faith play with these themes. Yeah, so um, that's important. I think we would talk a little more about the structure of, of the way culture structures faith. Um, can you watch you even get a little more complicated than that? Um, that's going to be the sort of two topics of next time um, that will flow out of the first topic, which is going to be about um, God and AI. And like, would it make sense to think of AI in uh, deific terms, thinking of it as some sort of God? Um, like, like, would that, not a, should we or shouldn't we, but like, what's the logic behind that claim? Does it hold up? How, how should we think of God? Those sorts of things. Um, so we'll do that next time. Thank you very much for the comments. Um, and right. thank you again, Kayla. I want to welcome, I hope everyone enjoyed today's class and that you are able to join for next week for the third session. And if people have questions, Rabbi Morrow, how can they reach you? Um, so email levidmorrow, levidmorrow at gmail.com, but also I'm on, on Twitter too much, so it's pretty easy to find me there. Uh, same at levidmorrow. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Looking to for forward to seeing you next week. If you want to join us for more Grisha classes, you can find out and register at 5784.grisha.org.
slash spring. Take care and have a good day.